Okay, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Alan Herrmann. Uh, Dr. Alan Herrmann is the founding dean of the School of Public Health at the Medical University of Southern Africa in Pretoria. And he, one of his claims to fame, is that during the anti-apartheid movement, he was with Stephen Biko. Stephen Biko was a student at the University of Natal's Medical School. Uh, so was Dr. Herrmann. So without further ado, Professor Dr. Herrmann. Thank you. I was, I was very moved by Jeffrey Wright's uh, performance here today, and uh, I'm, I'm a physician who wanted to be an actor. <laughs> so maybe between the two of us we could cover all the bases. Um, when I first walked into this building, what struck me was the photograph at the, it, as you walk in, and that's the photograph of my old classmate. We've known each other, and of course, I'm at Lamini Zuma, and I've known each other since 1973. Uh, we graduated in medicine from the University of Natal. And one of the things, that, the reason I'm pointing that out is that Nkosazana actually understands the nature of the beast. The nature of the beast of NGOs from someplace else getting all the money and those folk in the country getting none of the money and trying to figure out how to solve the real problems when the NGOs leave and go back to London or Paris or someplace else. Uh, Sydney Poitier called these people poverty pimps. African pimps are all over the continent. They care very little for Africans. They care very much for their own stature. So one of the things I want to drive home is that we need to speak to how to empower Africans. I'm an African. I got my degree in medicine and my PhD from an African university. I came here and I see myself as an African in America. My kids are African Americans. My wife is an African American, but I'm an African in America. I'm always going to be an African because out of Africa, great things come. And until and unless we may empower folk to be their own stewards, we're going to have another epidemic coming out of Africa and some fool with a fancy degree and a fancy title, will wander over there and make some stupid mistake, and we'll all give them a, an award and applaud them because they helped in crisis. I've gone through a tuberculosis crisis, an AIDS crisis, now Ebola, and every other conceivable condition. And I am sick and tired of people telling me what is going on in Africa. I've got two doctorates that I got from African institutions. I worked at the NIH, I did all sorts of fancy things. And people don't listen to Africans because we don't have a voice. And when you speak truth to power, you get labeled in some peculiar way. And there are folk in this audience who've been labeled that way. And so they keep quiet. And so I'm an optimist, I'll tilt at a windmill if that windmill has a remote chance of toppling over. But I want us to talk to this particular single point. How do we empower Africans to find solutions for their own problems? Not how are we going to help them, because I don't really need your help. I never have. And I come from a slum in just outside Johannesburg. I don't need your help. I need you to make me a powerful agent of my own life. As the great philosopher said, I need you to empower my identity and not celebrate yours. That's right. So that's what I hope we're going to talk about. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Donald Schreiber, who's worked at the CDC for many years, and maybe he can tell us how we can successfully create a Centers for Disease Control that is Africa. Well, I actually think we need one in Southern Africa uh, one in Central Africa, maybe three in Central Africa, because that's where a lot of the epidemics come out of. And Roscoe, where's Roscoe? Roscoe was the second EIS officer of color at the CDC. I was the first African to be offered an EIS job at, in Atlanta. I chose to go to New York because I wanted to be close to Broadway. <laughs> Our interests were very different, Oscar. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> Donald can tell us a little bit about how we go about establishing that kind of entity. Uh, and you can present from where you're sitting. I'll just stand there and, uh, and try and uh, not interfere with your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And 
I did want to offer a new definition of insanity, which might be to follow such, can you hear me? Um, to follow Jeffrey Wright and you and the brilliant opera singer that we heard at the podium and try to um, equal their presentation. So I'm going to speak really briefly and we have a lot of wonderful people here in the audience and on the panel. And I hope we can get to your point about how we empower um, Africans, because I think that's centrally about what we need to use this opportunity to do. Uh, remarkable progress already has been made on the continent of Africa, led by Africans um, in the fight against HIV, against malaria, against measles. Millions and millions of millions of people are alive today who wouldn't have been um, because of the strengthening of African institutions and because of the development of expertise among African health and other professionals. And I think that's centrally what we need to be about. Um, I think we're at this moment in time, really, we're at, it's really a crucible about which way are we going to go. Or as someone at the World Bank said to me yesterday, are we going to plan this response in New York or in Europe, or are we going to plan the response in Freetown and Monrovia? Um, and I think it has to be the latter. The, the response to the Ebola outbreak needed to be country-driven. The rebuilding that needs to take place needs to be country-driven. And we need to have serious and difficult conversations about how we do that. Um, at CDC, we would like nothing, nothing excites us more than when we see a Center for Disease Control started whether it has our name on, on it or not, whether it has that, that name or not. In China, they started a number of CDCs. The word CDC doesn't mean anything in, in China, but they like the, the name. Um, what's exciting to us is when there's an African-led institution. Sometimes they're called National Public Health Institutes, but we need them regionally, and we need them in every country, and they need to be staffed and run by Africans. Um, and we shouldn't settle for the idea that Africans can't be trained at the same level as our EIS officers in, in Atlanta who go and move on to prestigious jobs around the world. In fact, CDC has a program called the Field Epidemiology Training Program, which is an awful uh, name, but essentially it's EIS, it's training the best and the brightest all over the world to take over health programs and be the public health leaders of the future. And, and sadly, there weren't those programs in the three most affected Ebola countries, but there were in many other countries in Africa. And graduates of those programs surged into the, that area, as, as did, importantly, the AU. Um, the, there will be a lot of money moving into the region. The US government has just made available billions of dollars for Ebola and for global health security. That's an extraordinary thing. And um, we have an opportunity to use that money wisely. The World Bank has made huge pledges. The EU has made huge pledges. Once we get the economies going and people are healthy, tax revenues will be generated. But the key thing, I think, really is empowerment um, of leaders in the, in the affected countries. Um, there needs to be a response that's led by them. They have to be sitting at the head of the table, and the donors and technical agencies like ours need to be working in a supportive fashion. I think we learned in the Ebola response, sometimes that happens nationally, sometimes that happens at the local level. We need to recognize those local differences. We need to recognize that there are going to be political sensitivities. And we need to ultimately keep in mind the needs of the people that were, were there to serve. And again, to this point of um, wanting to stay in Africa and have, you know, we're, we're, we should not be working, those of us in the U.S. government or in NGOs, to have um, travel experiences or to have interesting experiences overseas. That's not our job. We can go and Africa's the most beautiful continent of the world and I've seen almost all of them and I can 
you know, go there on vacation with my wife and son. I don't need to do that, you know, if, if I don't need to do that with taxpayer dollars or to have a good experience. What we're there to do is to actually get out and, um, and ultimately to be in a relationship like we have with many rising middle income countries where we're there as peers. We're there as scientific collaborators, sharing information. And that's, I think, the direction that we really need to be headed towards. So I'll pause there, and um, I look forward to a robust discussion with um, you and my distinguished Quick, Quickly panel. introduce Jessica Rafford, who is the president of International Public Health Advisor. I met Jessica yesterday and had a short but very interesting conversation about the work she's done. And I'm sure she's going to enlighten us a little bit more uh, about uh, how to engage Africa and Africans in the appropriate way. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank CFA for asking me to be on the panel. And I had written my notes, you know, right before I came here. And then I've heard all these wonderful speakers. And I completely changed my mind about what I was going to talk about, of course. And I think it goes to your point about the work that needs to be done to build capacity in Africa. And I'll give uh, a couple of experiences uh, of what I've been doing recently. I've been involved in Africa since I lived there in the 70s. I've been working in malaria control and prevention uh, in Africa since the late 90s and in HIV since the beginning of 2000s. But um, work that we've been undertaking recently is to build capacity of advocates to ensure that they understand the domestic financing needs of programs in healthcare. What we see, and, and that includes not only infectious disease, non-communicable diseases, but we talk about healthcare infrastructure, which is pivotal, as we've heard today. An example I can give you was we were in Sierra Leone at the end of June, and we brought together a group from the ministry, from the faith-based organizations, from the private sector, to get them to, to build their capacity to understand what commitments their governments have made. How much funding is coming into their country? Who's active within the private sector? To get them to contribute to the financing gaps and the needs of the country. Unfortunately, after we left, Ebola really hit Sierra Leone, so we haven't had the, the ability to go back. But the ultimate goal for me is, building advocates at the country level, giving them the information to build health coalitions, whether they be malaria coalitions or Ebola coalitions, to really understand and put pressure on making sure that domestic, domestic resource mobilization happens to meet certain targets that the global community has agreed upon. I think that while the trends, as we know, for health financing are definitely going down, I think that I can say that, thankfully, health is taking a prominent role as we, as we end the MDGs and we're going into the Sustainable Development Goals. The target three, which is ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages, absolutely includes healthcare infrastructure. Again, my point being that we need to create the advocacy at the global level, at the country level, to ensure that health is not an afterthought or an oversight within the financing budget. And I'll give you, right before I close, because I've got my, my colleagues on the panel have a lot of things to say as well, a great example of, um, of Minister of Health from Namibia, Minister uh, Kamwe, who I saw last week speaking. And he said something to me that was just fascinating. He said, and he said this in a group of people, he said, you know how I make sure that I get health in the ministers of finance budget? It is a policy in Namibia that when a minister takes leave, he has to have someone acting. And guess who I put in my chair when I leave? That minister of finance is sitting in my chair, so he knows exactly what those needs are and why we continue to request financing within the Minister of Financing budget. Now, I think that is essential because the breakdown and the disconnect is many ministries are not, and ministers of finance, I should say, are not including health within their budgets because they're so used to getting it for free. So I would, I would suggest that 
and I would say that CFA is a prime organization to work on this advocacy role at both the global and the domestic level. So thank you very much. I think we're just going to go in order of, of people sitting at the table so we don't jump back and forth. And I'm ask, uh, I'll ask Dr. Vanessa Steele to talk. She's from Bombing Gilead. And every time I see those words, I think of that old spiritual. It's a Bombing Gilead that makes the sin sick whole. And I think what we really want to do is to make the sin sick in Africa whole. Absolutely, and after that I'll try my best not to sing the song. Good, good afternoon, and I too am very happy to have been asked to be here to be a part of this very, very, very important conversation. The Balm and Gilead, for the past 26 years, we have been working exclusively with faith communities to address health issues. Uh, here in this country, primarily with the African American community, African American faith communities, and in Africa, for now 16 years. With the funding from the Centers for Disease Control back in 2000, we went into Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa, building the capacity of faith communities to address which, what was then the greatest health challenge, HIV. But our role as the bomb in Gilead, as we saw it, it was really building the capacity of faith communities to address the next health crisis, because there's always going to be a next health crisis. Today, the greatest health crisis is Ebola. Tomorrow, we know that it's going to be something else. Why faith? Because when you talk about sustainability, there is only one institution that is, has been sustained since the beginning of time, and that's faith communities. Throughout Africa, no matter what country we are talking about, we are talking about, I looked up last night in the stars, it was very clear over Richmond. We could see all the stars, and those stars for me last night represented all the faith institutions, all the little churches and all the little mosques and all the temples in all of our communities, urban and remote communities. And each one of those stars has an influencer. An influencer that leads that community every single day. An influencer who says, yes, let's take this vaccine. No, let's not take this vaccine. An influencer who says Ebola is uh, from the devil or who says Ebola is a public health crisis. We must understand the, the critical role of faith and why we must have them as partners. When we talk about sustainability, I always say that there's only one institution, the Bomb and Gilead. We understand that when you work with faith in communities, you're able to reach everybody in the country within 24 hours through word of mouth. I call it, it's the way the gospel goes down. It's the way the, the Prophet Muhammad continues to speak every single day. So the bomb in Gilead, our role was to utilize that already existing sustainable structure and put public health information and provide technical assistance on that already established sustainable, what I call a railroad track. When we went into these countries, of course we caught resistance not necessarily from faith communities, but from outside forces. Who said, why faith? Who said, why give faith communities funding to work, to do this work? Well, having the experience, Bomb and Gilead, Pernessa Seal, I'm an immunologist by design, having worked in communities like Harlem for many, many years, understanding how organizations and resources come and only 1% comes into for the community that's actually doing the on the ground. How only 1% comes and the majority of funding go to other institutions. Understanding that the bomb in Gilead, we did not want to replicate those kinds of issues. So for example, in Tanzania, where we still have an office today, I remember when we worked with Muslim community and worked with the Christians and the Muslims and brought them together and I said, I'm going to build your internal capacity 
Christian uh, uh, institution for Tanzania. We're going to create an HIV office in this national headquarters. I'm going to give you a little bit of my bread. I'm going to cut my bread in half. I'm going to give you a piece. I'm going to pay you to come to work. I'm not just going to give you $5,000 and do a program and no money for salaries. We changed the entire paradigm of how NGOs, foreign NGOs, worked in the country. Now, you know when you change paradigm, mm, a lot of interesting things happen, but we don't have time to talk about that today. The last thing I want to lift up is when we're talking about faith communities. I was so honored to hear so many of the messages that uh, Mr. Wright spoke about. Perhaps faith communities, let's use the example of Tanzania, there are over 1,700 dispensaries and hospitals run by faith communities in this country. Perhaps it was a, a, a Lutheran church that came by in 1920 and built a house hospital way out in the bush up in Shinyanga. And today, that hospital structure is right there. But there's only one person, one doctor, he's probably about 60 years old, who stayed behind, and he's the one doctor in the whole area of 700,000 people. Or perhaps a Catholic church built a, built a hospital out in Kagoma, you know, in 1950. They're gone, but that one nun is still there. The dispensaries may be under the tree, but it's where the people still come when they have a problem. There may be an aspirin there. But it's where the people come. It's where the people believe. They believe that at this place, I'm going to get the right information. It's this, this place I'm going to be respected for who I am. And this is why we cannot overlook the valuable resources of faith in our, when we look at global health issues in Africa. Lastly, and I can, you know, I deal with Baptist preachers, so I can go lastly many, many times. <laughs> The last thing I promise is that when it looks, when we, I want to use the example of the Ebola crisis. We African Americans, many of us, we know many bishops and many members of our churches that have died from Ebola in West Africa because we are connected by our faith. We have sent monies and we have done a lot of uh, collecting of a lot of money and items to send to address the Ebola crisis because we are connected through the African Methodist Episcopal Church or the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church or, the, or our historical black church denominations. I see Reverend Nixon in the audience and the, the extensive work he's done throughout Africa through our African American congregations. The success in working with faith communities and in other African countries is that, you know, we have to send people in that understand people. Sometimes it's important that the people who you send in to work with the community look like the people you're going to help. And I cannot lift this up very importantly because one of the success that we have had in Africa over these 16 years is the Bar Mangilia has been only one of one African NG, na, international NGO working with faith. Why has it worked? Because we understand each other. We look alike. We eat collard greens and we, we eat fried chicken. That's very and very important and we understand we understand the traditional linkage and how we see God as one. Whether I'm talking to a Muslim in Nigeria or a Christian in Liberia, we are one. We are one because we are connected through the traditional path of the one God. And I'm going to honestly stop there. Thank you. So when I saw Greg Simpson, Simpkins sitting next to me or behind me, I realized I knew him. And I knew him because in 1995, 96, 97, Ron Dellums and I decided that something had to be done about AIDS in Africa. Because at that time, about $10 million was being spent by the US government to deal with this problem. And Ron and I uh, wrote a bill for Barbara Lee 
which was co-sponsored, interestingly, by Lindsey Graham, called the AIDS Marshall Plan for Africa. We borrowed from George Marshall. And it became PEPFAR, and lots of people uh, tried to tell us that PEPFAR was created by somebody else, but we know where the start was, Greg. And so Gregory is the staff director of the U.S. Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights. And um, every time I see folk who've been doing this kind of work, I'm reminded uh, of the first time I worked in Congress. And uh, I've worked with lots of politicians all over the place, and they're all similar. But among them, there's always a bright golden light, and you're one of those. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, you know, uh, what you're saying highlights the fact that, um, that Democrats and Republicans actually do work together in Congress, despite what you may have heard on Africa. On other things, maybe not, but on Africa, we do work together. Now, when people hear what I do, where I'm from, they focus on the Africa part, but they kind of neglect the global health, global human rights, and international organizations part. And we take global health very seriously. For more than 10 years, for example, we've been working on uh, addressing fistula. Uh, we have um, worked on autism, which you might think of as an American issue, but it was raised to Chairman Chris Smith by a Nigerian. He asked him, well, what are you doing on autism? He said, well, in, in Nigeria. He said, well, nothing. Since then, we have been doing something. Uh, Alzheimer's, which is uh, certainly a problem here, but it's a global problem and much worse in developing countries. Hydrocephalus. You know, we had a conversation about a bill we had with USAID. I don't know if there's any USAID people here, but they were kind of dismissive because it's not much of a problem here. But I worked on a case with a woman from Ghana who had a, uh, who was carrying a baby who had hydrocephalus. The doctors in Accra said that they couldn't do anything for the baby, but her sister lived in Boston. She got Massachusetts General Hospital to pledge to give, uh, to, to um, uh, deliver that baby for free. But the uh, State Department wouldn't give her a visa. So she had the baby in Accra, and the doctors let the baby die because they didn't know how to deal with that. That's one of the things we want to make sure never happens again. Now, We've worked on neglected tropical diseases on Ebola. We've had three hearings on Ebola, and I think we've gotten some things done. Uh, not everything we want. But we did get some more money for international disaster assistance, but there's more to do. One of the things we couldn't do was health system strengthening. We wanted to put that in because clearly the Ebola crisis showed us, which we knew before, that a lot of these systems, healthcare systems, weren't up to snuff. But the reaction in, in Congress was, well, that's going too far. Let's deal with this emergency situation. So we resolved among ourselves, OK, we'll let this go for the uh, appropriations bill, and we'll come back and work on it. And since December, uh, we've been having meetings with stakeholders. And if you're a stakeholder and you haven't been at one of these meetings, it's only because we haven't tapped you on the shoulder yet. But we, we'll get you. We've talked to USAID. The Centers for Disease Control, we're about to talk to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We want to build legislation uh, that taps into what's already being done, because in the current financial situation, we can't come up with something completely new that relates to nothing, because for every dollar that we propose, we have to cut a dollar somewhere else, and it makes us feel like vultures. Uh, you know, I, I really don't want to be a vampire doing that. Um, we have what we call horizontal programs largely in healthcare. That is, you talk about AIDS, you talk about malaria, we focus on a disease and we do everything we can to deal with that disease, which is not necessarily related to what we do with another disease. Meanwhile, there's horizontal programming to deal with healthcare systems generally and making sure they have what they need. The World Economic Forum has a, a health system strengthening task force, which we've been in touch with, they're proposing what they call uh, diagonal programming. That is, connecting the, the different silos of the diseases to address the horizontal program, that is, the, the healthcare systems. So with that, we're looking at legislation. I just want to give you an outline of what we're looking at. We can't do all of this at one time. We're looking at what can we do now, what can we do next year, what can we do the year after that. This is a campaign. It isn't a one-off. 
it's going to take a long time to do this the right way. Uh, the two bywords are capacity and sustainability. Now, one is systems management. You know, you have to have the facilities, be they hospitals, be they clinics, or mobile facilities, because what, one of the things we've also seen in, in the Ebola crisis is there are people who live way far out. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult to get to them. They're not coming to the hospital. It's too far away. Or they have never seen the hospital, never been to the city. So you need to go to them. Uh, power and water. You know, power and water is critical for everything. But just think, as, as I think you were talking about earlier, about having to operate in a situation where lights are in, uh, intermittent. But what about the medicines? They have to be refrigerated. If you don't have that, that refrigeration, that medicine is not going to last very long. Uh, medical insurance, because a lot of poor people don't go to the doctor, not because they don't know where the doctor is, they can't afford it. So we need to look at that. Uh, personnel management, so you have all of the trained people that you need to have and people to replace them when they leave to go somewhere else. Finally, finance, because we have this issue here in America where hospitals are taken over by for-profit companies because the hospital couldn't sustain itself on its own. We have to figure out how do these hospitals stand or clinics stand and continue to stand after the Danes and the Americans and the British say, okay, well, we've done what we can. They need to keep going. People aren't going to stop getting sick because we're not giving money. The second thing is physical resources, like equipment. Uh, I had a program training um, uh, folks on Nagoa, and in Nigeria, we talked about the possibility of working with companies that have clinics that would have facilities for people in the country who could afford it and expatriates. They would have CAT scans, they would have x-rays, they would have all these machines that the local clinic couldn't do, but they would then make it available to them. It wouldn't, they wouldn't own it, but they would have a chance to use it. Uh, supplies, beds, bedding, gloves, all of these things are consumed and they have to be replenished. Uh, medicines. Uh, too often you have uh, folks buying medicines from, from places where it's expired. Uh, and, and no offense to India, but a lot of Indian medicine is, is, is just either counterfeit or it's expired. Um, medical workers, you know, the recruitment and retention of medical workers is critical. The brain drain has taken so many doctors out of Africa. In fact, it's said that there are more doctors from Benin in the city of Paris than in the entire nation hmm. of Benin. Mm. When the Ebola crisis hit in Liberia, there were 50 doctors, 50 for the whole country. Mm much less than that now. That, that can't continue. Uh, training. Uh, doctors here train all the time. You're always getting recertified of, of something. Um, I used to work with an organization that dealt with the University of Miami Medical School, and we were going to do a training program bringing Nigerian doctors and nurses. Couldn't get visas for everybody. But there is telemedicine, and we're looking into that. Um, salaries. I mean, the push and pull for getting people off the continent. Uh, obviously, you're not going to make exactly the same kind of money there that you would here, but you have to make it more attractive for people to stay. If a doctor can make $350,000 doing operations here, what makes you think that doctor is going to stay there for 20? So we have to work on that. Uh, medical research, there has to be access to information and data so people stay up to date. Um, testing. Uh, we learned in the Ebola crisis that there's just not enough testing facilities. People in Liberia had to go all the way to send all the way to to uh, Li to Monrovia to get the blood tested. Well, there there's small kits that can test the blood. We have to get the equipment to the people in the field. Uh, traditional medicines and treatments. You know, it's been a, a a dream of mine that we would have a system where some of the pharmaceutical companies would work with people on the continent who have treatments that they've used historically but have never gotten tested, they've never gotten certified, they haven't gotten a patent on it, so both sides can benefit from it. Uh, outreach and partnerships. You have the international organizations like the WHO, which was a bit slow in the Ebola crisis. Uh, the World Bank, which some people say actually steers money away from education and health programs. Uh, donor countries. They have to do more than pledge money. They have to actually deliver the money. 
Uh, local governments have to be a part of this. Community leaders, civil society, faith-based organizations, traditional leaders, and traditional healers and herbalists. As, as you said, you go in, you do a health program, vaccinations or whatever you leave, if they haven't been a part of it, they're going to say, no, that's no good. That's, that's, yeah. They don't understand. They're not a part of it. They have to be stakeholders. And finally, behavior change. Uh, we have to do practical health information. All of us were taught when we were kids by your mother, probably, maybe your dad, wash your hands after you go out and play because the germs you carry in, we don't want them you know, infecting the food and you. People there don't necessarily make that connection. It isn't innate. It's something somebody teaches you. And people don't do enough teaching on that. We, we take that for granted. Um, sanitation systems. You know, cholera should not be that big a deal, except the sanitation systems aren't there. You know, people die of diarrhea in, in Africa, and nobody would think of that happening here. It's because of lack of clean water, and we have to remedy that. And finally, damaging traditional practices. Uh, in the Ebola crisis, you had people who clung to the tradition of burying their family personally rather than letting somebody else do it. Now we think, well, what's the matter with you? How come you don't know? I just explained it to you. Well, in their system of belief, if I don't take care of my family here, mm -hmm. when I go to the afterlife, That's I'll right. be punished. That's right. You can't, I mean, because we don't take time to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, we just play that off. But you can't play it off. It's important. Um, female genital mutilation is more than just a human rights issue. A lot of times, those operations, if you want to put it that way, are done in, in less than hygienic situations. And women have continuing health problems from that. Fistulas. You know, I, I saw in Ethiopia a lot of the women who had fistulas were uh, looked down upon and just ignored. And it's easily fixed. It's, I think, a, like a 20-minute operation. But they don't do it everywhere. Everybody doesn't know how to do it. And these women are shunned. We have to get beyond that. So we're looking at all these things. We can't do everything at once. We're looking at what can we do now, and then we'll move on from that. And any support, any assistance, any advice that you have, I appreciate uh, you, you giving it to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make a quick connection before I go on to uh, Mr. Mallet and his comments. Um, a very long time ago, I was working in a very poor part of, uh, uh, in a gold mining town. And I had my first real connection with faith-based organizations and went out to a very remote part of this town to do uh, child health clinics. And unfortunately, there was no table to examine the babies on. And I talked to the local pastor and we used the altar. And, and to him, it was completely appropriate. Absolutely. And the interesting thing was I was able to get into that community because although I'm Western trained, my grandfather is one of the, was one of the most well-known traditional healers in the Eastern Cape, just close by from where Mandela comes from. <coughs> and in fact, his name means doctor. And so when people heard that, I was accepted because I actually was doubly trained. I was innately gifted as a healer and I went to this fancy medical school. And <laughs> It struck me that the connection with community made sense, and the church sometimes gives resources that are not visible, because you think of the church in one way, and we actually had the kids line up, come up to the altar, be weighed, be examined, and be given food and be sent out again, and we had a real measles epidemic where measles was actually killing people, not this thing out in California where you get sick, you get dots, and you get healthy. You actually die because you're malnourished. And the church was our savior, as it were, for this resource that was closed during the course of the day. So I think sometimes when you go into these communities, you have to look much more carefully. I repeated the same trick of working in a church in Tennessee, in um, in, in, in this very interesting place where Elvis Presley and other people w were raised and black folk didn't have access to diabetes care and I worked with the church. Mm -hmm. And we had our diabetes education programs in the church, not the church hall, the church in fact. Mm -hmm. And the pastor there was absolutely important 
to get the message across. And the sermons were written for him to talk about the need for good personal care mm -hmm. and using the Bible as his source. And we talked about this all the time. So faith-based organizations aren't just places for us to put our ideas into, right. but they're places to teach us about the care of human beings. So I wanted to make that connection and Amen. go to, to, to Mr. Mallet, who is actually talking about health systems and uh, really interested to, to hear what he has to say about clinic development and so on, which, because that's a real critical need. Thank you very much, Dr. Herman. And I am delighted to be here this afternoon, and I, I, I will finish my presentation. I wanted to stay for the uh, response, but I have an imperative. That is that my uh, car expires on parking at, in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, and if you've ever gotten one of the tickets in Georgetown, you know what that means. So I'm going to go through this presentation and apologize to uh, the respondents that I won't be able to stay because I am going to move that car. <laughs> I, I, I am president of a small organization. It's called the Accordia Global Health Foundation. And I want to say right off, it is a grant-seeking foundation, not a grant-making foundation. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we do is we are very committed to building permanent capacity for healthcare uh, leadership and innovation uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a vision of a healthy Africa where every individual can thrive. Our mission is to overcome the burden of infectious diseases in Africa. And the strategy we employ to do that is we try to help establish, support, and sustain African Centers of Excellence. Now, what do I mean by African Center of Excellence? It has three components. It is a locally owned sustainable health institution focused on local or regional challenges uh, and aspiring to global standards of, of, of quality and care in three areas. World-class clinical and operational research, effective workforce training and education, quality clinical and laboratory services. Now, we sort of know it when we see it, but these are the components that we look for and we seek to build. Uh, an institution that has strong support systems, encouraging transparency, efficiency, and sustainability. Number one, a strategic use of information communications technology. Number two, effective resource generation capacity. Number three, monitoring and evaluating continuous improvement. Four, deliberate strategic planning processes, five, strong and transparent financial systems and grants management support, and six, good governance and strong leadership. We try to help to fund those things. If, if you're not moving in that direction, we don't want to do business with you. That's not where... Our flagship center uh, on the continent uh, is something we refer to as the Infectious Diseases Institute at McCary University, which we helped to build. And when I say we, when I was an executive at Pfizer, Pfizer actually provided the seed money, uh, about $60 million over a course of years, as a catalytic investor for the IDI. Uh, and we went to Uganda for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons we went is that the Ugandans were willing to invest themselves. They donated the land for the building, and we built the building. Uh, and we said, the other thing you have to do is you cannot apply a VAT tax at the end of every year on employees. That this is not an operation where you get and then, and then you don't sort of give back in some way. If you're not going to invest in some of the trainings we're doing, that you have to eliminate the barriers and allow the IDI to flourish on his own, and, and Uganda was willing to do that. The result is, in about 10 years, we have trained uh, 14,000 healthcare workers from 28 countries. We have had 50 studies uh, that are currently underway. There have been sort of more in this year. In, in, 2014, in 2014, some 52 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, we've done specialized clinical services for more than 100,000 HIV patients, 60,000 malaria patients, uh, and the IDI has been responsible for helping to stamp out three Ebola outbreaks in Uganda. The country with the most Ebola outbreak, outbreaks, there have been six, is Uganda. The reason they've been able to control uh, those outbreaks, and you've heard very little about it, 
is because we had an organization like the Infectious Diseases Institute that helped to take the lead in stamping out those, those outbreaks uh, uh, in Uganda. Uh, we, we hope, Accordia, uh, our 10 year goal was to try to replicate the IDI twice. So we thought of, and we, are, we have established the West African Infectious Diseases Institute in Nigeria. Now I, I, I neglected to say at the beginning that these institutions are African-owned and African-led. Uh, when Pfizer built the building uh, uh, for the IDI in, in Kampala, it turned over the building to Makeri University. Uh, in Nigeria, we are located in Abuja, uh, we have now developed a consortium of 12 universities in Nigeria, and our focus there would be on research, clinical, operational research very important to get the research, to get the evidence, to get the data, so that you can drive public policy, so that you know what to ask for. Uh, our second, our third institution that we're trying to create, uh, and we are just in the beginning stages of fundraising for it, we just got a quarter of a million dollar pledge uh, from someone who wants it to be matched, so if anybody here wants to match that pledge today, I'm happy to take your card and call you immediately after I move my car. Uh, the Institute for Child Wellness in, 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 Mal in Malawi. Uh, what we took a look at was the condition of children throughout the continent, and one of the things that was quite disconcerting were the data around children remarkably the same from country to country. In Malawi, for instance, 10% uh, of girls uh, are married before the age of 15, 50% of girls are married before the age of 18, uh, 46% of the kids drop out of primary school. Uh, the, the, the wellness statistics for children uh, are quite disturbing. At first I thought, well, this is Malawi. It's a small country, only 16 million people. Uh, this, you know, this cannot be true of the entire continent until we begin to look at the data, and it was absolutely true and really quite disconcerting. So that's our, our next large enterprise, and, and uh, wish us luck in, in, getting it, in getting it underway. But now here I want to end on a couple of questions for Food for Thought. As we reflect ourselves on the work that we've been doing, and obviously we're very proud of it. Uh, as I said, it is led by Africans. We simply uh, help and support uh, what they do. And that help and support comes in the form of university partnerships from the United States, from Europe, from Canada, uh, where uh, postdoctoral students uh, go over for some period of time. Pfizer has a global health a fellowship program, which I established when I was an executive there, where, where for six months a colleague would go over and work in any different areas and many uh, NGO institutions. But what are we worried about? We're worried about is whether or not the model that, that we have helped create it with the help of Africans, whether or not that model is replicable. If it is not replicable, it is not systematic. And if it is not systematic, the change is not permanent. So we worry a little bit as to whether or not we're creating all of these very fine local experiments that don't sort of take off uh, around the continent. Secondly, we've, you know, we think launching three excellent centers in 10 years is, is quickly, uh, 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 and we've done that. But we wonder whether or not our vision and our programming get well ahead of our resources. So, and is that not the problem of many health institutions uh, in Africa, where we have an idea, we want to help, we want to do something, but it gets ahead of the money we can raise for it. And we end up creating a lot of institutions that are not very effective. And finally, whether or not we should be looking at the metrics that we've established around centers of excellence, and whether or not uh, they, they are, in fact, the appropriate metrics. Culture, tradition, Religion, all of those things are extremely important. And I don't know whether or not uh, we have adequately thought about whether or not the metrics established can be met by people who have to live up to them if they're not helping you set those metrics. It's a very difficult question for us because I mentioned before all of the things that really make a uh, Center for Excellence. All of us know that. There are no exceptions because it's in Africa. We have to have transparent financial systems. We have to have good management. We have to have strong leadership, good governance. This is not exceptional because, there's no exception because it's Africa. But as we sort of establish those things, 
whether or not we need a different colored lens to look at how we measure that. And that's a very significant question for us uh, as we seek to, to seed these institutions and see if they can be duplicated in other places. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My, my dad used to tell me that uh, every group of people has a similar proportion of geniuses and fools. Um, that idea drove me when I built the National School of Public Health, where I decided that you needed to actually create a universal standard of intellectual excellence. And if you grow people to the highest level, they'll take over and they'll do exactly what they want to do because they have the skills. And uh, over the course of eight years, we graduated in the order of about 300 uh, master's level in public health, which was unheard of from all over Africa, and another three or 400 people with certificates, that's one year of education. And they actually had more difficult examinations than people at Hopkins, because they, they had to go out by themselves to remote places to fix things that were difficult to fix. And so the idea is that every society has very many smart people. If you put stuff in front of them, they actually react. The way students at Hopkins react or Harvard, I taught at both, or George Washington, or any fancy university with a fancy title, most people react to those stimuli in exactly the same way. And so I think one of the things we have to contemplate when we work in Africa is that these are the same people as we are, and they react to the same challenges the way we would, and we'd get the smartest people. In fact, one of my students who got a PhD under my, my, my supervision is now dean of a faculty, and, and I expected him to become dean. He was that smart. That's he. But I didn't say, well, I'm going to train you to be a dean. I just trained him to be a good scientist. That's all I did. Um, and I think that's the point you're making is to answer your last question, the standards must be the same. If you differentiate standards, you actually get really bad results and people do things uh, in programs that don't make sense and the system collapses. Sustainability is based on similar standards throughout the system. And that's why I can teach at fancy uni universities here yeah, because I was trained by people in Africa where the standards were exactly the same. They assumed I would do this. <laughs>